out uh, a sheet to go along with what we're studying today um, but I know everybody's still settling in did any of y'all go to that WKU game yesterday I think I saw Josh Crawford just go by I think it was 73 to nothing is that right wow they, they should have opened up the offense a little bit on that game it's a uh, it's a little low scoring we are um, we're in Job we are really kind of approaching this as a more of a survey it's not a verse by verse study uh, so uh, I would ask you in your thinking at least to pan out uh, and consider uh, Job from a different perspective what that will allow us to do is to see um, even with that being the case a lot of uh, the arguments that are going to be made a lot of uh, the purpose and meaning behind why this is in the book um, Today, our intention is to go, uh, uh, my assignment is Job 4 through 14, but you'll notice as you're getting your uh, worksheets, we're going to start in chapter 3. I didn't get there last time, and it's, it's important to set up what's going to happen in chapters 4 through 14. Um, so, 
Um, trying to kind of watch and see is has everybody pretty much got a, a sheet that wants one? Raise your hand if you don't. Okay. All right. Um, so Job three is thank you, Todd and Tommy. Who are, is that? Who helped? Okay. I, I multitasking. I couldn't remember. I saw somebody doing that. Um, Job three is after all the calamity has happened. The friends have shown up. They've sat with him in the ashes. Job is, has lost everything. I want you to try to get a picture of how pitiful this man who was once the most powerful, influential person that anybody who knew him knew, who has now lost all of his... He's gone from the, the penthouse to the, to the outhouse, really. He's, I mean, even worse. He's sitting in ashes in a terrible place. He's lost all of his children. He's lost his dignity. He's lost his health. He's sitting there, as we describe, with the, that broken pottery, and he's, he's scraping those boils, and those friends have come, and they've sat there. It had to have been hard to have seen Job in that condition, to see this once mighty man reduced to a shell of himself. I mean, you think about that in a physical sense. You think about somebody you've known for decades of time, and you knew them when they were young, and hale, and hearty, and strong, and, and, a, and a dynamo. And maybe something has reduced them. A, a stroke or cancer or, or just the, the onslaught of time. And you see them and you think, man, the, the, you know, how, how time has effaced things. But this is more than time. This is circumstance. He's been brought so low. And, and if, you can, if you can get that, you understand why Job uh, 3 is as it is. Really, Job 3 is three questions. Um, if you wanted to label Job chapter 3, it's the death wish speech. Now, when I say death wish, you didn't hear me say suicide because suicide was not an option. You'll notice that. Nothing, no time does Job ever say, I'm going to take my own life. He had it in the power of his hand to do that, but he didn't do it. Who does he put his, whose hands does he put his, his life in? Not the friends, God's. And so knowing that what he wants is, God, I want you to set things straight. I want you to make things right. I want everybody to know that this is not because I've done something wrong. Please show. And that's why there's going to be this increasing call for a Redeemer. Now, if we get that far in class, we get to Job chapter 14. We often try to interpret Job 14 through New Testament glasses on this side of the cross. And we can think about like Job 19.25. I know that my Redeemer lives and He'll stand on the earth. And by the way, it's a great song for us to sing in church. But that's not what Job is asking for. He has no clue about the cross. It has no meaning to what he's going through. What he's wanting is vindication in this life. He wants a redeemer, an avenger, a goel, a go-between. He wants somebody to advocate for him in the face of the friends, as we'll see today, to show, to, to vindicate him. He's right. He's not done anything wrong. God has said as much. He's innocent. So I want you to keep that in mind. By way of setting up what we're going to see today, there are 17 speeches beginning in Job chapter 3. And Job is going to give nine of them. We're going to have three friends we've already been introduced to in Job chapter 2. Um, Eliphaz and uh, uh, Bildad and Zophar. Uh, we can make some assumptions about uh, the, their ages. Elihu is... Uh, going to come along later. He's younger. Uh, he waits to speak. It could be, very plausibly, that Eliphaz is the oldest and it just goes in order down from there. By the way, did you know that Eliphaz is quoted in the New Testament? Maybe if you study real closely as you go through. I know that's how you read, right? You go through and, you, oh, here's a cross-reference. I'm going to go over there. That. I don't normally do that, but you'll find that what he says in chapter 5 and verse 13 is quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 19. Uh, of all the dialogue, now Job is mentioned as an example in the New Testament, but we don't have any of his dialogue in the New Testament. The only character in the book of Job quoted in the New Testament is one of those friends. They're bringing the best scholarship of the day, the best that they know how. They're also bringing representative uh, philosophies and ideas. It's not like you got the whole world and you got these three upstarts over here who have this different point of view and they're going to come bless Job with that. You know who else also shares their theology? At least before it happened to him? Job. So it's rocking his worldview. 
He's having to reorient as he sits there in the ashes and say, all right, let me come face to face with the fact that I have assumed what we all thought. You doing well? God loves you. God's on your side. You doing poorly? You're suffering? Boy, what have you done? All right, but now he knows on the other side of the crucible of chapters 1 and 2, he hasn't done anything wrong. Look, I'm not suggesting to you that Job has not sinned. He's going to say later, talk about the sins of his youth in this particular section that we're looking at, that God's rolled all that up. He's dealt with it already. And he's right. I believe it. We may have mentioned this in passing last week. I believe that we can say that Job did not sin in this. The, the inspired writer of Job says that. God tells the Satan that. So here he is, even in this trial. Now, what's interesting is, find the verse where Job says, I sure wish I had my health back and my children back. Now, he bemoans the, the pain that he's in. That's not what he's ruining and regretting. What is the thing that bothers Job about his current condition? People think he's sinned. Okay. People think he sinned, so that... That speaks to what part of his life? Not his portfolio. He feels like he has a broken relationship. His, his, his spiritual life. Say it again, baby. He feels like he has a broken relationship with God. That is the key to understanding Job. He feels like his relationship with God is injured. He doesn't know why it's broken, and he wants it back. Man, even after all of that, and I just, it, it makes, don't, you, don't we do this as we go through Job? It's hard not to, as you walk through the book, to put yourself in his place. We don't, none of us want to be there. But we put ourselves in that place and we go, how would I have responded? Would, I, would that have been what was at the heart of my heart as I've lost everything? Would I have been there going, Boy, I just don't know what's wrong with my relationship with God? Would we not go, man, I just want these boils to go away? I want my children back. Man, I, I, I'm out of resources. I, I mean, we do that to some degree when we have little small setbacks. Job helps us to see what's most important when everything is stripped away. You know, it's become fashionable to talk about um, what heaven is going to be like. And I'm, I am firmly non-committed because I, I haven't been there. I couldn't say definitively. But so, so often I think we're a little bit misguided to say I haven't had the incentive that um, I could have if I believe in, in um, something that's, that's presented as something I may get and I'm going to enjoy uh, in eternity. Now look, don't, mis don't misunderstand. It's going to be wonderful to be there. What we've sung about, what we've prayed about, what we've studied about is true. But Job is showing me, Job's had all the blessings stripped away. And he shows, that book shows us why is God to be served? Why? Why, does, why should we serve God? Because of His greatness. Because of His greatness. Because He's God. Period. Why do I want to go to heaven? because God is there and I want to be with Him. You know, work out all the details. Is it going to be boring to worship God for all of eternity? All the things that we kind of get... You know what? God is going to be there. And I love the poem and I fall back on it all the time. My knowledge of that life is small. The eye of faith is dim. But it's enough that Christ knows all and I will be with Him. That's it. And Job is showing us as everything has been torn away from Him just give me my relationship with God back. Alright, so the three questions. Why was I born? Verse 2 through 10. Um, so a fair question. If he th knew that it was going to happen like this, he was going to get to this place, why was I born? Number two, why wasn't I born dead? It sounds like the same question. It's a little bit different. He, he wishes that the uh, midwives who were in involved in his birth would have just not received him that he would have come out dead. And then number three, why can't I die now? No, questions one, questions two, they're, they're moot, right? Because it's already done. He's born. He wasn't born dead. His question is, why can't I die now? Um, that's what he's left with. Um, interesting thing, and, and again, we can't look at everything. I wish we could. 
In verse 23 of chapter 3, he says, Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden and whom God has hedged in? Any of y'all's versions say that? Does he use the word hedged? Anybody catch the irony of that? What's the irony of that? What, what did Satan say? You put a hedge around. You kept me out. What is Job saying? I'm, I'm hedged in. You know, that hedge that was there has been removed by God's permission, but now he feels like he's, he's trapped. He's in a straitjacket, so to speak. And he's trying... So here, here, so put your, yourself in the picture here. Here's Job in the ashes with his three friends. Job's the first to speak after seven days and seven nights. The friends have heard that. Armed with their theology of the day, so you can just see them raising up in the in the ashes, and they're just you can you can almost can you almost see their body language shaking their heads and just rolling their eyes and going, "What, mighty joke? What are you saying?" All right, so that's what prompts the speeches, and you're going to continue, if you will, continue to keep that thought in your mind about the consternation and the the disbelief. On these friends, we know that they don't turn away from that because Job 42 verse 7 says that they did not judge this thing rightly. They misrepresented God's justice and so they never moved off of their basic premise that He's done something wrong. You know what they'll do? They'll go, okay, let's take the obvious. Alright, he's, he's given us a pretty good answer about it. it's not the obvious sins. So what's worse than the obvious sins? Those hidden ones. Boy, you must really be wicked in secret. So, so they, they never do move. And Job, it's going to be, and what I'm going to try to do is highlight for you as we walk through Job's responses to that. All right, so in chapter 4, we have, uh, in fact, it's Job 4 and 5. You'll notice I, I have it there. We have Eliphaz who speaks first. He's going to speak three times. He's going to speak in Job 4 and 5. He's going to speak in chapter 15. And he's going to speak in chapter 22. Now, for those of y'all taking notes, I know that you can't take all this down because of how, how quickly we're having to move. But if you look at those three speeches, the, here are the main arguments of Eliphaz. Okay? Here's his primary ar uh, arguments. Number one, God causes the wicked to suffer and the righteous to prosper. If you can't, if you can't keep up with the rest of it, this is, the, oh, this is the overview of his approach with Job every time. God causes the wicked to, to suffer and the righteous to prosper. Now here's some of the specifics of that. The, he says in chapter 4, verse 7 through 9, the innocent are never destroyed. The innocent are never destroyed. Now he, he says that. Now let's, of course we have the benefit of New Testament. We have the whole Bible. True or, or false? I mean we can think of over 70 million innocents who've been destroyed. We know that's not true. But we know other innocent people. We've seen the ravages of war uh, where there have been heroes and heroines who have died for their righteousness. We saw that in the early church we're going to see the innocent suffer. But that was the premise. He also would indicate that the wicked, wicked suffer torment all of his days. Now you can write that down if you're uh, taking notes in chapter 15 and verse 20. So there he, he says... Um, the wicked are always in torment. True or false? Then do we wonder why others prosper living so wicked year after year. Alright, number three. Um, he claims inspiration. We'll say a little bit more about that uh, in a moment. Did you, if you read through chapter four, wasn't that incredible? Isn't that a little bit of a timeless thing? He says, this, this vision came to me. And you ever heard anybody claim that uh, that what they said is uh, got to be right because they got it in a vision? It still happens. It may happen to you. I mean, I guess I know I hear it more as preachers, but if folks know that you go to church, uh, they're apt, and if they're oriented this way, they go, God spoke to me last night and He gave me this. Hey, you think about it. Could He have gotten a vision? Is it possible? With all we know already in Job. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about Eliphaz. But where might it have come from? Satan. Uh, Satan has, has left people alive. He's, he's killed people. God's given him quite a bit of latitude to do what he's doing. Maybe. Maybe he got this. And it, and it came from uh, Satan. Um, 
His, his, he also argues that suffering is the result of defying God. That's in chapter 15, verse 24 through 26. He circles back in every single speech to this basic idea, since Job is suffering, it is because of sin. By the way, they're one-hit wonders. They all, they all play that song all the way through. All right? uh, suffering is a means of discipline, he'll say in chapter 5, 17 and 18. True or false? Suffering is a means of discipline. Making sure that you're... Yeah, could, yeah, under right conditions, that's true. That's Bible. Hebrews chapter 12. Now, um, Eliphaz is also going to show that those... Uh, and I just lost it there. I think it's in chapter 4. Those who... Um, um, oh, those that plow... Somebody find that for me. It's in chapter 4 or 5. It's, it's in the book of Job. Say it again. It, maybe 4, 7, and 8. All right, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble um, reap the same. True or false? Isn't and that, and that Galatians 6, 7? All right, but what's the problem with what he's saying? Yeah, he, he's judging unjustly here. His, his major premise is wrong. We'll come back to that. All right, and then the last argument that he makes is that if Job is to be relieved of his suffering... He must repent and confess. He says that in the first speech. He says that in the last speech. You know, when we don't have all the facts, sometimes we might be just like these friends and assume that that's what's going on. When somebody seems to apparently be tr- uh, struggling in some way, may, we may not say it, we may not say it that harshly, but that may be the message we get across. Well, if you were just more faithful, if you just have more faith, if you just, you know, we're just... If you put your priorities a little bit straighter, then maybe you wouldn't be in this condition. I don't know if I've ever said it that way before, but maybe some of my advice has been oriented that way uh, to my own regret and shame. Maybe what I needed to do was to get a little bit more information about the situation. All right, so let's look at Job. Um, Job, uh, Eliphaz begins, I think, in a, a very good way, doesn't he? In Job 4, 1 through 4, you've been a servant to others by lifting them up. Now in chapter 4, verse 5 through 11, the tables are turned, and now Job is the one who needs the help. Um, uh, Eliphaz does say there in that section, according to what I have seen. All right, well, that's fair enough, but he's drawing on his experience. That's the problem. We haven't seen it all. Nobody in this story, except for God, has seen it all and knows it all. Um, In verse 10, the the lion, the king of the beast, is quieted by God. Who's he referring to? Who's the lion who's been quieted by God? It's Job. Um, in verse 12 through 21, we have uh, Eliphaz's supposed um, uh, vision. Now a word was brought to me stealthily. It was this quiet vision that he received. And he talks about what the Spirit says. And Eliphaz basically says, God knows you're not fooling anybody, Job. If the greatest of God's creatures, the angels have sinned, then who are you? They were doing such a good job. They were such comfort. And then what was in their head started coming out of their mouths and poor Job. Chapter 5, he continues his argument. Um, Call now. Is there anyone to answer you? I don't want you to miss. This is a blow. When they say, here's what here's Eliphaz says, call out now. Who will listen to you? Well, who will listen to them? Who's there? Okay, God's there, but that's really not who they have in mind. When he says that, what's his point? Yeah. Where's everybody else? Now, by the way, when we get to Job 19 next week, Job's going to say, I mean, he lists all these different relationships. The people that he used to, in his kindness, barely take notice of, but really others in his position wouldn't even see, they won't have anything to do with him now. Every relationship, they've cut him off. So basically they're saying, wow, Mr. Formerly Mighty, call out. Who's going to listen to you now? Man, that's that's rough. Now, Job's mad, verse 2, and Eliphaz is basically saying, yep, that's the way wicked people live. So basically they're taking every little thing and they're turning it against him. Um, he's, he hates, or he curses the, uh, the houses of the, the wicked. Chapter 5, verse 3, he's in this, so where's Eliphaz? He's in this great position of not suffering. And he has, he has that, that moral authority, doesn't he? To just say, wow, you're... Man, I, I, I don't even pay attention to the wicked. They're so, they're so horrible. Chapter 5, verse 4. His sons are far from safety. What does he say? 
His sons are far from safety. Hey, where's your kids, Job? They're gone. Why are they gone, Job? Well, according to Eliphaz. Because what you did. You, you remember, what is it? When you think about what Job says about the friends, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? What's the phrase of Job's? Miserable. Your miserable comforters. I can see they earned that designation, didn't they? Man, he rubs those seven sons' deaths that have just happened not that long before in his face while he sits there in the ash heap. Um, in verse 8 through 16, Eliphaz has a solution to the crisis. Listen to this again. I would seek God. He implies that Job hasn't, as he himself would. I would place my cause before God. God is great, and he answers prayers. Again, God is great. God answers prayers, but that's not what Eliphaz is saying. What Eliphaz is saying is, if I. What a tough statement. We got to be very careful about ever saying. If I was in your shoes. I would handle this different, Job. Um, he was so off base. It, it took a sacrifice and a prayer from Job to keep him from dying. But this is what Job's hearing. This is the this is the first blow. I mean, from the get go, he comes out of the gates just pounding him. Yes, sir. I think that's where we all. Well, I'm gonna personally say that's where I I, I fall in my ditch. If I was in your shoes, because none of us can ever. Walk in their shoes because their circumstances are so different for each one of us. Yeah. Uh, you just never know uh, what the other person is going through. That's right. I, I, I do that totally different if I was you. Now you don't know that. Uh, you may not handle it near as well. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and really, what we aren't told in the book of Job is what kind of relationship did they have before this? Um, they're coming from a distance. There seems to be a real, genuine relationship there. Maybe, you know, sometimes we feel more comfortable with the people that we know better. We feel like we can speak a little bit more plainly to them. The, the, the problem was it's not what he needed. And the second problem was that what they had to say was just, was just wrong. It was off base. Um, I, and, and you wonder how they got to that place. But, but I think here's the bad news. I think Eliphaz is the most eloquent of the three friends. He's, he's really the front line. I mean, it goes down from there, as we'll see in just a moment. All right, so we get Job's response. Um, and if you want to, I think I have some statements here. Here's what it seems to me that Job is saying. Number one, my words are fully justified. Job felt like he was right in saying what he had said. And, and, and you go back and you look at that. Can you find any fault what Job says? Except the, for the fact, the one thing we can fault Job for is he thinks God is doing this. Um, he never entertains the possibility that it was the Satan. Um, but when he's what he's what he's saying is is good. It's not off base at all. Um, he's really you know in the scales of justice, shouldn't the punishment fit the crime? If if he's done something so bad, isn't this kind of a heavy-handed response? He's not saying he believes it's that way, but he's saying if the friends are right, this is too harsh. Because you, you're having to dig to find something I've done. And God's done all this because of that? It doesn't make sense. Number two, I still wish to die. You've not really given me anything that makes me want to go ahead and live. I'm wishing that God will do it. The, the way that, that would have been thought, there were people in those days uh, we have Sumerian um, civilization, some of the early civilizations. Suicide was not unheard of. It was not unpracticed in the ancient world, but it was not a Hebrew thought. Basically, it's God, the power's in your hand. If you will, just let my spirit go. Just let me go. Okay? Uh, number three, you friends are a disappointment. Chapter 6, verse 14 through 23. He was hoping after they had sat there with him for seven days that they would have something better to say to him than what he's hearing so far. You know, when you're down and out, aren't you counting on your friends to pull you out of that? I mean, I just I, I'm I'm trying to think about Job just sitting there. He had to have I mean, for all that he's lost, he's had has to have at least that little warm feeling in his heart. Man, I knew I could count on Eliphaz and Bill Dad and Zophar. They've come from such a distance. They're sitting in the ashes with me. I know they'll help me to get some good perspective on this. And what a disappointment. 
Now it's really an affliction that's been added to everything else that's happened to him. Um, number four. He's asking them something that I'm not sure I would ask. He's saying, take the gloves off. Be frank in your accusations. Lay it all out there. For, don't hold back. Tell me what it is you think that I've done and what I need to do. That's how he ends uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 24 through 30. He's saying, be frank, be open in, in your accusations. Number five, he's saying, I want to die. Chapter 7, 1 through 10. After he declares that he's sinless, um, he's, he's saying, I, I just want this to be ended. But that's not all. That's not his last word on the subject. He says the, something that he's going to say r- repeatedly until God does answer this request. I want to talk to God. I, I want to have my day with God. I want Him to appear, to tell me, to share with me why is all this happening. Um, and that will come later in the quarter. Uh, that's chapter 7, verse 11 through 21. All right, next guy we can call Mr. Insensitivity. Bildad. Bildad gets three speeches. Chapter 8, chapter 18, and chapter 25. So if we want to paint the picture of him, he's harsh. He tells Job explicitly that his children died because of their sin. Chapter 8 and verse 4. He rebukes Job for not listening to his friends in chapter 18, verse 2 and 3. He calls Job's words a mighty wind. You're a windbag, Job. Chapter 8 and verse 2. And he says that Job's ignorance makes it impossible to communicate with him. You're just hard-headed. Won't you just accept the message? You're a sinner and you just need to repent. Glorify God. It'll all get better. Have you ever repented or told somebody you were sorry when you really didn't? Or weren't? or Or had no reason to? Why would you? Why would you do that? I mean, not not has a person that way. I don't want you to think. Everybody's gonna think. Oh, I wonder what he's talking about or what she's talking about. But did people ever do that? Did they ever say, "I'm sorry, I was wrong" when they weren't? Why would peace? Now I'm trying to imagine if you get to where Job's at, you're not too worried about peace. You don't have any peace. Would you ever do that? So so you understand where Job's coming from, right? You want me to repent. Be frank. Tell me what I've done. I'll do it. I'll repent. So far, you're striking out. I'm not going to repent of something I didn't do. So, But Job comes back in his second speech. And that's what he's calling for. You need to just just own up to it. And all this will go away. All right. Um, Bill Dad's uh, first speech in chapter 8, he expresses his theory on why Job is suffering. uh, Verses 1 through 7. God is just, so it has to be a just cause. Um... He has a theory of, of God's punishment in verse 4. Um, y'all, syllogisms are when you have a, a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. If the major premise is right and the minor premise is right, then logic says the conclusion has to be right. All right, so here's the way that uh, Bill Dad approaches this. Uh, the, the major premise is sin causes suffering. Minor premise, Job is suffering. What is the inevitable conclusion in Bill Dad's brain? Job is sinning. What's wrong? It's the major premise. Right? Sin causes suffering. That's wrong. Um, It does sometimes. A lot of the suffering that we go through in our own lives, we can trace back to sin. Our sin, someone else's sin, that's not always the explanation. Sometimes things happen that we've not precipitated, we've not caused. Um, What I want you to notice is, is that Job never accuses God of being unjust throughout this entire book. He'll never say that. Job believes that God is just. That's why he can't uh, make sense of this. He doesn't understand what's going on. Um, Bildad also tells him, do not ignore the wisdom of the fathers, verse 8 through 10. We ever do that? I know this has got to be pretty solid because my my dad thought this way, my granddad thought this way, and my great-granddad thought this way. And they're good people. And they, they were good... Old Testament language. They're good church going, or uh, this is even, this is before the the the, the synagogue. They, they, they're, they're good going to, before God at the altar. Patriarchs. My dad, my granddad, my great granddad. So if they believe that suffering's because you've sinned, it's got to be it's got to be solid. All right. So they're perpetuating that. By the way, that doesn't that extend to Jesus's day? It's a theology that dies pretty hard. Remember the man who was born blind. Remember what they said in John chapter nine? Who sinned? I'll give you multiple choice. This man 
or his parents. Jesus said, I'm not going to fall in that trap. It's none of it. And, and the thing is, you think this is such an ancient philosophy that Jesus exposes. You'd think that we wouldn't fall prey to that. But we do sometimes. All right, Job's reply. Oh, by the way, we have his counsel in verse 11 through 22. Uh, Bill Dad's repent. Basically, that's it. All right, these guys are just hitting him with the same thing over and over again. And by the way, he points out what his sins are. What were Job's so terrible sins that he's suffering all of this? He forgot God, verse 13. He was godless without really any kind of qualification or, or defense of that uh, position in verse 13. And he's arrogant, verse 15. All right, so let's look into chapter 9 and 10. Job replies to Bildad. What's his reply? And your headers may help you with that. But what Job begins to answer Bildad, what's the first thing he does in chapter 9? Someone just read the first couple of verses of chapter 9. Can a man be righteous before God? Can a man be righteous before God? All right, keep, get, keep reading if you don't mind. If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. God is wise in the heart and mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and prospered. Okay, maybe one or two more verses. He removes the mountains and they do not know when he overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. He commands the sun and it does not rise. He seals off the stars. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. Okay, so kind of what... If you were to try to describe the flavor of what Job's doing right here, what would you say? How would you describe what he's doing? God does what he wants. God does what he wants, but what about what God wants? Huh? He's praising God. Really, if you look at verses 1-15, through 15, he's acknowledging how great and how just he is. But this is worship. Job responds to Bildad's really rough three arguments by saying, hey look, God is awesome. He's amazing. There is, there is no getting around the fact that he does what's right and only what's right. He does nothing that's evil. So that's his first answer. Again, there's so much in Job that I want to emulate in my life. When, when somebody is so harsh to come back by praising God and saying, look, I'm with you. Nothing wrong with God here in all of this. Never will be. All right, that's verses 1 through 15. Number two, he expresses confusion on why that great God that he's just described will allow this to happen. Now, I want you to notice in verse 20 through 22, four times Job uses the word guiltless and righteous. He's saying, Look, guys, God is wonderful. He is worthy of praise, but I haven't done anything wrong. I'm guiltless, I'm innocent. Number three, he wishes for a mediator. Chapter 9, verse 25 through 35. He says, I want an umpire who can stand between us and he can, he can weigh your words and my response, your accusations and my situation. Number four, chapter 10, verse 1 through 22. He repeats his death wish. We get that. Man, and, and what we don't have here, and I don't know, how does this play in your mind? Do you see this is happening one after the other after the other? Are all these conversations happening back to back? I don't know. There are going to be some things, there will be some textual cues that go along that indicate there may be some months involved. And what's happening in the internet? Are they sit, they're obviously not sitting in the ashes for two, three, four months. They're, they're going to, to get some food and they're you know, drinking water. They're doing some other things. But some period of time is going by as they try to sort through what's going on. And he's just saying, I, I hate my life, verse 1 and 2. Uh, you hate my life as well, verse 3 through 7. You made me and you have power over me, God. Verse 8 through 17. So why not just let me die? Let's just end all of this. Now, let me ask you a question. I know it's a bit philosophical. Could God have done that? Why didn't God do that? Wouldn't it have been compassionate for Job just to be out of his suffering, his misery? Does, the, let me ask, does God know how Job's feeling in the depths of his soul and his being? So why does he let it go on? His plan wasn't finished yet. God's plan wasn't finished. God's plan wasn't finished yet. And what was that plan? A great testimony of faith. 
Okay, I think both of those answers are right. A great testimony of faith. God knows the end. He knows how this is going to turn out. He knows that Job's going to hang on to his integrity despite every possible force against it. And he knows, and he has the opportunity to show uh, Satan up. He knows how this is going to end, and he's going to show Satan, and oh, that's not all. He's going to show me many centuries, millennia later, that I can do the same thing. Okay? All right, Zophar. Oh, wonderful Zophar. He only gets two speeches, 11 and 20. I wonder if he just, he had no bullets left in his little gun, and so he doesn't even have a third speech. Um, he's got, he basically comes from the same direction. He's got the same arguments. He lists some different uh, sins of Job in chapter 11. You're arrogant, verse 2 and 3. And that's an easy one to throw, isn't it? Uh, because you can use your own surmising. You can take somebody's words and you can twist them in, in the way that makes suits what you're saying. You're self-righteous. Again, not real easy necessarily. It's subjective, verse 4 through 6. You're opinionated. You know it all, verse 7 through 12. And you're stubborn. Why is he so stubborn, verse 12 through 20? Yeah, and you won't listen to us. The wise, the, your wise guys, your friends that have come. All right, so then chapters 12 through 14. And I heard that bell ring, so let me just make what I think is the most important point here. There is a major turning point starting in chapter 13. You, you're going to notice it, it's not going to make Job necessarily kinder and gentler, but it is going to make you more evangelistic. What does Job come to see in addition to his, uh, his defending himself? What major revelation does Job have? Look at verse 9. Somebody read verse 9 of chapter 13. All right, so let's think about that. Now, who, this is Job speaking. Who's he speaking to? And what does he say? What does he ask them? And in fact, not if. What does your text say? When? when will it be well with you when he examines you? That's pretty insightful. Um, by the way, no spoiler alert here. Will it be well for them when he examines them? Huh. So you're going to notice in the rest of the book of Job that Job is going to channel, he's going to refocus his concern. You guys are wrong. And you're setting yourself up for some big trouble. Um, you have got this thing completely off focus. Um, by the way, I just want to reiterate this in the time we have. Um, in the Old Testament, when people are thinking about vindication, they're thinking about being righteous, they're thinking about uh, all things being made well, what are they thinking of, typically speaking? What are, what are they worried about? They're, they're themselves certainly, and that it's not a condemnation statement. Who came to, to who came to show us that He's the resurrection and the life? Who came to to teach us? Remember, that's what Jesus came to do—to show us the Father, to, to to reveal His will. Somebody think in terms of the context of the Old Testament. How many statements are made about the judgment, about heaven and hell in the Old Testament? Why does one want to be in favor with God in the Old Testament? so that it will be well with them here. So the boils will go away. So the children would not have died. So, uh, so maybe the possessions will return. or Whatever could be restored. That's what Job... I want, I want vindication. That's why he says, in my flesh, not out of my flesh. I want God to show these friends, I didn't do anything wrong. So please, God, make an appearance so I can know. Now, is it, is it great for us to be able to have the benefit of the cross and what Christ came to bring? to understand why we live and why we endure. It's different for us. They, they were looking for, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, they were longing for what you and I already know and have. But for Job, it's much more simple than that. Righteousness equals vindication in his flesh right there. Please come and mediate for me and show them that I am right with you. Now, I don't believe that they were without uh, some belief of right, they had their the concept of Sheol, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. I do believe in context it's talking about eternity. Uh, God will bring every work in the judgment with every secret thing. I believe Solomon's going to live uh, much later than Job does. 
How much Job saw of the afterlife, we can't say, but that's not the point. That's not what he's talking about in Job chapter 14. He wants vindication now. By the way, we're like him. If we look like we're suffering and we're doing the right thing, we want the world to know we're, we're faithful. We're right with God. He's not cursing us. But we want something far greater than that. We want to hear Him say, well done. Alright, any thoughts or comments? Alright. It may be a record for me. I, I was determined today. I was determined to... to you got the next one too? No, oh. I'm not. I'm not in here for a while after this. All right, so there's that one. Yeah. I don't know. Some of these I can't read. <laughs> As I stand in front of your thing. I don't know what that means. I do that. I don't know. I've been trying oh, to decide. I that. sure would love to do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.